justice is an attribute of individual action. I can be just or unjust towards my fellow man. But the conception of a social justice, to expect from an impersonal process, which nobody can control, to bring about a just result, is not only a meaningless conception, it's completely impossible. See, everybody talks about social justice, but if you press people to explain to you what they mean by social justice, what they would ex accept as just, nobody knows. I'm telling you, because I've been trying for the past 20 years, asking people, what really are your principles of social justice? We're all born equal, and we should all be equal, but the reality is we're not. Huge levels of housing precarity. Welfare reform, hostile environment. Voter suppression, the prison industrial complex, Trayvon Martin, Michael Brown, Freddie Gray, George Floyd, and Breonna Taylor. None of this is fiction. This is all historical research. My colleagues and I, we're not making stuff up. They are convinced that if they give us uh, the power to manage our own communities, we will become as them and we will treat them the same way they treat us. They don't want this to happen. Social justice for us means uh, paying attention to the distribution of power, of money, of resources, um, you know, and really uh, being concerned with that and trying to distribute things more evenly. You know, I think being a museum of homelessness is, is extremely clear in our everyday activity and our everyday encounters with people that, um, you know, there's significant inequality, uh, significant to the point where, you know, we document in hundreds and hundreds of preventable deaths of our community. Well, you know, the issue of social justice underlies all the work that we do at the museum uh, because African-Americans have had um, a long uh, history uh, from slavery all the way to the present dealing with different uh, forms of social injustice. And so we have consistently, you know, fought, uh, uh, for, you know, our rights uh, as first-class citizens. Um, we have uh, sought social, political, and economic equity, um, equal access to opportunities, to privileges, to wealth, um, and of course, uh, equal rights through the civil rights movement. And really those things that I just mentioned are the real uh, four principles um, uh, that should apply to every individual uh, in every nation of this world, um, equity, uh, access, uh, full participation, and uh, equal rights. The idea of social justice is always present because um, as a Black person growing up in Europe and in Brussels in my case, um, it took me time and it took me um, the time to become an adult to realize that some uh, experiences that I had been through that were considered as normal because they were happening every day were not normal and were not things that I should accept as an, as an individual and that those experiences were not something that we should accept as a group, uh, as a community. My, my particular view of social justice comes from having engaged with and interrogated the history of empire, the history of science and scientific racism. Um, and you know, when, when, I talk about, when I talk about race in a historical context, race is a very, very broad church. Um, so the, the mechanisms whereby race was an idea operating within science and within the empire is you know, that you can tell everything you need to know about a person by the way that they look. You can tell about their behavior, their intelligence, their character based on their physical appearance. So that extends to things in terms of people's ability, in terms of people's intellect, in terms of um, how they are gendered, how they are sexualized in a society, um, and even perceptions of sometimes of, how, how, of people's religion and how that relates to how they are racialized as well. We live in a world where we are being 
told that there is something wrong with um, with the African culture. There was something wrong with the fact of being black. There is something wrong with the fact that uh, you, your skin. Uh, that, that there is something wrong with, with us. To me, those ideas are the structure, or well, they feed the structure that is the, that causes social injustice in our time, that causes inequality, that, so, that causes inequity in our society. Because what those ideas did was that they suggested and they legitimized the idea that some people are inferior to others and that this inferiority was somehow natural and that, some, and that it's an unavoidable, that it's a, it's a fixed thing. You're not on an equal footing. Uh, you may be on low pay with uh, you know, somebody who earns 150k a year telling you what to do, and <laughs> how efficient you should be. Um, there is a lot of inequalities in society, and that has an impact on where you sit in that society, what barriers you experience, what limitation, and no, Everybody is not, you know, equal. You know, we're not the Museum of Homeless People. Um, we're the Museum of Homelessness. So if you put homelessness into, I don't know, something like a Google Ngram viewer to find out the number of times that homelessness appears in written records, you will see a sharp incline um, going like that in the 1980s. Why is that? Why did homelessness get turned into a, like a noun? Why did it become, why was that shift? And it, was, and it says something about how we as a society have evolved, about our relation to housing, about our relation to uh, welfare, about our relationship to capitalism and what, we, what it means to be a society and our relationship as individuals to the concept of home. And that has changed and has really, really evolved. And something happened there. And what is that? And we have to question why that is. And that's the, that's, that's the double side of, that's why we're so multifaceted as an organization and that's why it's one of our values to be questioning, um, to kind of interrogate, not just historically what's happened, but also what's happening right in front of us now. So it's not just about income or work. Uh, it's also about access to services for health services, education, culture and museums as well. Uh, but now we also see some additional issues that have been added on. Um, we've seen the climate change issue, for example, uh, coming into the field of social justice, because what we see is that people are not affected in the same way by climate change, and they don't produce pollution and climate change in the same way. There is, again, an imbalance of power there. But we've also seen that sort of just that social justice uh, agenda across many struggles, you know. All those voices that we didn't hear in the past, you know, they want to be at the table. They have that enough to be silenced. I think it was in 2014 when the the Africa Museum decided to include a group of uh, African experts. They didn't really decide to do it because it was a proposal from a group of associations of the diaspora they had been working with for a long time already. And when we started, nobody was talking about decolonization. I think that even myself as a militant, decolonization wasn't really a term that um, I would use on a daily basis. We were more talking about diversity and uh, maybe inclusiveness started, but um, the term decolonization really started to be present uh, into the group of experts um, itself into 2015, like one year after we started working with the, the, the museum. And um, the museum adopted this term of decolonization in 2016 when, the, when Bruno Verberg uh, started as an operational uh, director at the Africa Museum. There's also a thing that was, that's called the Goldson Collection, more accurately really should be called the Eugenics Collection because that's the academic department that it was related to. Um, and I think a lot of the work that I've done specifically to do with the history of empire and scientific racism come from working with that collection because uh, it embodies really so much to do with institutional power, institutional legacy, 
but also the history of science and legitimizing the idea, a very bad idea of race. But in terms of the subject matter, um, people weren't really engaging with the eugenics bit of it, you know. We, uh, oh. And so when I got there, I didn't really, like I said, I, I didn't really have any aspiration to critically engage with the history of scientific racism when I started working with this collection. I didn't even know that that was a thing. Um, I understood about racism because I'm, as you can see, a non-white person working in a predominantly white institution, but it wasn't something that I had a vocabulary or a particular mission, you know, to take on. This African Museum, this so-called now African Museum, is an institution that has been built by Leopold II. He really constructed a regime of terror for the Congolese populations that were forced to labor and to work to extract those rubber from the rubber trees into the region of the equator, into the Congo. The King Leopold II had to, to manage to receive the support of the society here uh, in Belgium for this enterprise. And he started to speak about the fact that he wanted to save Congolese people from slavery, from the Arab slavery, and that he also wanted to bring civilization into the Congo. And he created this museum of the Congo um, that was the name of the museum. Francis Galton is a Victorian scientist and he is the man who coined the term eugenics in 1883. Some people have suggested that I say that too much, but it's important that I say it because when people think about eugenics, more likely what they're thinking about is the Nazis, the Holocaust, the Second World War. And to me, because of having discovered this history for myself, it's important to point out that the Nazis did not pull their scientific racist ideas out of the air. They pulled those ideas out of really well-established British, American, European science from the end of the 19th and into the beginning of the 20th century. The, the thing that I hoped to achieve really was nothing more than just getting the story out there. I thought this was an interesting story. I thought it was a story that wasn't being told. And it came out of the context of both student and staff protests at the university in terms of the fact that we had buildings and spaces named after these famous eugenicists and that we celebrated them as famous scientists, but we didn't interrogate them and we didn't, you know, critique that commemoration in any kind of meaningful way. Bricks and Mortals, which is an exhibition and a podcast, which your listeners can still download off the UCL Culture website. Um, the reason why it exists in the way that it does is because I didn't have a permanent museum space with which to, in which to put an exhibition on. Like that's normally the thing that you would do as a museum curator is you have a museum, you put on an exhibition, people come to see it. Um, I didn't have the luxury of that space, but the fact that it was to do with the buildings, the fact that it was to do with the campus meant that there was an opportunity to turn the whole of the UCL campus into a museum and to turn those individual buildings into exhibits to be interrogated, but also as objects in themselves as to, to tell the story of the, the pivotal role that UCL played in legitimizing eugenics as a science. In 2003, when the museum started to think about it's new it, uh, about its reno about its renovation as um, it was at the beginning because they were the the, um, the building itself was collapsing. Yeah, uh, it began uh, with the killing of Michael Brown. That was when we decided to go, um, go to St. Louis and to meet with the community there and with the family and to um, collect objects that were evocative of the events. We wanted to collect, of course, items that were evocative of the moment um, um, that, that documented the uh, marches in the streets, many of them led by local clergy. So we collected uh, garments that were worn by individuals during the marches we collected uh, uh, items associated with um, the artistic response, such as uh, theatrical performance costumes. Um, we also collected um, items associated with the cleanup effort after um, some of the rioters destroyed buildings. Um, so there were cleanup implements uh, that the uh, local government had distributed to, to residents 
to kind of restore their neighborhoods that were damaged. We also collected things associated with the damage, with the burning of buildings such as uh, signage. Um, and then of course, we collected uh, a host of photographs that um, photographs of those uh, street scenes, the, the peaceful demonstrations, as well as the, the violence that occurred. And really the thrust is to have these things available for curator, curators 50 or more years from now so that they don't have to go and look for those things. Um, we can preserve, collect them, preserve them now and curators can use them and interpret um, the events um, 50 or more years from now. And they can uh, you know, use these objects to, to gauge the, the progress, the social uh, justice progress that we've made or the lack thereof. <laughs> uh, so, um, so yes, yeah, so, the, so the rapid response uh, collecting has, has been very, uh, very significant. My aim when I started was, okay, I want to change the narrative because uh, it was showing the African culture and the Congolese culture present in the museum. Um, um, as if we were still into the 19th century and it was made in a very colonial context. You don't know the name of the artist who, who crafted the, the, the artifacts that are into the museum. Even the information that we have on those objects is very colonial. You have the name of the collectors, but you don't have the name of the artists. It seems like it's always white gaze that is more important. The white gaze upon those objects is more important than the, the, the African gaze. We have a, um, an icon iconic object in the museum to tell the story of mass incarceration and how um, mass incarceration is really a part of a historical continuum of containing you know, the body, the mobility, the life of African-American, predominantly men um, from slavery all the way through, um, through, the, through the present actually, through the present. So there is a guard tower from the, a, a prison in uh, Louisiana called the Angola prison. And ironically that Angola prison was a former slave plantation. Um, and this prison is notorious for incarcerating African-American men, uh, many of them for life. Um, and they generally are incarcerated based on trumped up charges or minor charges, but they get disproportionate terms of incarceration. So we have the guard tower. We also have a, a prison cell from that same uh, institution. And along with that, we offer statistics, you know, about the issue of mass incarceration, that the United States incarcerates more people than any other nation on the planet. The prison industrial complex is truly um, a business. Um, and it's a business that uh, unfortunately uh, preys upon communities of color. Let's say after a few meetings, we realized it wouldn't be possible to work as we wanted because we asked, okay, can we uh, change the scenography? Uh, can we stop working with those um, uh, displays um, that are dated you know that that really come from the 19th century but that that are not um, suitable for the 21st century now it wasn't possible can we erase the names of the the name uh, the, the inscription of uh, leopold ii that is really um uh graved um how can i everywhere into um, into the museum. Uh, no, it's not possible. The building is protected. The, the displays are protected. You cannot touch them. And you have, it's not even that you cannot touch them, but into the point of view, it was, we have to use them. 
for me, what I found is that there is two problems with uh, social justice and museums at the moment. One is that it can be just a tick in the box and a bit of publicity. And we've seen that around the Black Lives Matter movement where museums were very, very fast to um, make public statements in support of the Black Lives Matter movement, which we welcome, by the way. Uh, but then their employees uh, who were identifying as people of color were actually experiencing discrimination at work and that wasn't taken into consideration. So it's not just about the audiences or the story we tell, it's also about how we treat the workers. When you look at who was impacted by those redundancies, well, first of all, it was generally low paid workers because it was in their cafes, uh, in their shops. Uh, and those low-paid workers can often be part-time, they're often women, they're often people of color, uh, and there's a lot of disabled people as well. Uh, so the reality was that the actions of making people redundant and choose a particular sector meant that people of color were disproportionately impacted by redundancies. So there is a contradiction there. Uh, and what we say is we want institution uh, to not just be about words, but be about actions. And that's why I'm really pleased that uh, some of, uh, of our members in the union, we identify as people of color, black, Asian, and other um, ethnic groups uh, came together, uh, created a committee and work on not response, not uh, supporting Black Lives Matters in a vacuum, but actually created a call for action. And we send that letter to every employer, most employers where we represent members, asking them to look at concrete measures to support black workers or potentially new workers that they will recruit to actually really tackle those issues and not just talk about it. You know, our director Lonnie Bunch, often uh, our former director, but he was uh, the founding director at the time when he would always talk about the museum as um, telling the telling uh, American history through the lens of the African American experience. And inherent in that statement is that the history is one history and that African Americans have been central to that from the very, very beginning through the development of um, the institution of slavery and the economic, social and political implications of that over the centuries that would follow. So we have been central to helping this country live up to its ideas, ideals through its, our civil rights activism. Um, we helped to enact laws that applied to everybody across the board, civil rights legislation, voting rights legislation that um, applied to people regardless of race, class, age, nationality, religion, uh, ability, gender, sexual orientation, uh, all of that. All of this has been through the momentum, the knowledge, the skill, the expertise, the passion, the drive of African-American people um, in conjunction with other Americans who were progressive in their thinking and wanted to do the right thing. So in the end, uh, they gave us the feeling that they wanted us uh, to be to sit at the table and to just if, uh, and to sit at the table and to say yes to all their propo proposals but without giving our own point of view without giving our own yeah uh, vision they didn't expect us to have a vision they expected us to be there to sit at the table and to say yes to uh, what they to their own vision of the decolonization, uh, to their own vision of uh, this new museum, of this new permanent exhibition.
And um, I think we should have stopped. In reality, the permanent exhibition hasn't changed, uh, hasn't been changed and wasn't the objective of the renovation. The use of the term decolonization only became, only came at the very end when the new uh, director arrived and even into his uh, mouth, the word decolonization was just a buzzword. Working with black people is a good, um, is always good for the career of white men um, and also white women here. It's really crazy. Uh, we stay exactly like nothing changes into all eyes, but for them, it's always like a jump into their career. They become experts uh, all of a sudden. It's about agency and it is about, you know, my training is in archeology span um, and we, we, we were trained. I mean, we weren't, we weren't necessarily trained uh, and taught as much as probably I should have been about the, the imperial and the colonial histories of the discipline of archeology. span But within it was the idea of, you know, you have to think about who you are when you're coming to a particular story or coming to a particular interpretation, how is that shaping your view? Um, and I don't think museums have been very good about doing that. I think there was that thing about the curatorial voice, the museum voice, the authoritative voice of knowledge. And that's just not a thing. Museums are made up of people. People are the ones who tell stories. I have a personal um, history um, of homelessness. As, as a, I was homeless as a child, I was, uh, my dad uh, um, and my mum were homeless activists and I was brought up in a homeless community setting. So, you know, that was an important part of my identity, but one that I actually um, hid in my career in museums. I never felt I could bring my full and authentic self with everything that I entailed into my roles, into work and, I felt like museums could do a lot better. So we wanted to make a museum um, where people who have something in common with my own background could feel that they bring their whole authentic self and that that self is, um, you know, not only tolerated, that's not good enough, but is actually celebrated. So yeah, the, the purpose really in terms of community building was to make a space like that, which we didn't feel existed at that time in the museums world in the UK um, and the purpose in terms of wider society was to galvanize that community gather people to create social change um, and to challenge the inequalities that are leading to today's homelessness crisis we set out in the beginning wanting to tell stories and knowing that stories were powerful and, and they are indeed but um, it became quite clear quite quickly that telling stories wasn't enough so uh, the museum, driven by its community, also does uh, campaigning and uh, also carries out direct practical support for community members. So that might be, you know, um, carrying out what, what we call street solidarity, which we've done through the pandemic, which is actually being on the streets with people, checking in, um, being in solidarity with people and providing essential supplies. Um, or it might be supporting community members with legal battles like the museum does all of these practical things, sort of whatever is needed for the community to support each other and survive through what is a really serious crisis. First of all, uh, when we talk about inequalities, and you know, whether it's gender or race inequality uh, at work, quite often we're talking about the glass ceiling. And it's like you can't get above this glass ceiling and people from certain group can't, can't get above a certain grade. And that's true. And we should certainly work on that and change that. But it seems to me that most of the programs uh, that are currently uh, present are to break the glass ceiling. And we don't think about the sticky floor. And by sticky floor, I mean that once you are at the bottom, it's very sticky and it's very difficult to untangle yourself from that bottom. Should we talk about Truth of the Last 10 Years findings? Yes, we could talk about that. That was an exhibition we held um, at um, Clerkenwell Fire Station, the fire station base that we were that we've been in for the last couple of years. Um, that's been we had a residency there, but it was sort of um, stopped a bit by the pandemic. Um, and our big show there that we sadly didn't get much time to share with people um, opened in late 
2019 so just a couple of months before the pandemic hit and mm. yeah um that was called truth of the last 10 years and we were really yeah we were reflecting on a decade of rising inequality that was our residency and that was our first like base um so we worked with people in the community center um you know uh members of the queer community activists you had like lesbians and gay support the migrants were also resident there um african rainbow family who support lgbtiq migrants um and then the shelter guests of the outside project and we sat down with all of the um groups and over you know over a period of months we said what should we put on in this space and what came back was this idea of what everyone's been through in the last 10 years so the different forms of oppression that people used in that space had experienced. And we, kept, we, met, we created together a giant timeline um, through workshops. We, we got everyone to map out which policy moments had impacted their life for good or for bad. And, you know, since 2010, it's been extremely depressing. So, you know, some of the policy moments were you know, the Immigration Act 2014, Theresa May saying that she wanted to create a hostile environment. Well, that has happened. And for people who are migrants and homeless and queer, it's just extremely difficult living here. Why? Mainly because of social economic inequalities. You are on low pay. You're struggling to pay your housing. You may have to have a second job. You haven't got time to train or to do free work. Uh, you may start to experience health problem because you live in precarious housing. Uh, you know, you may have relatives that uh, have got more problem with their health because of poverty, and you've got additional caring responsibilities. You cannot pay for a child care for childcare, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And once you get embroiled in this sort of economic turmoil, it's very difficult to get your head above the parapet. Uh, I mean, I've experienced that myself, and it was impossible for me to apply for different jobs. You know, I didn't have the confidence to do so. I wasn't clean enough, you know. Um, I didn't have the drive and ambition. I had lost that motivation because of my socioeconomic conditions. And I think that's something we mustn't forget that if you're able to go back to a nice and warm house after work with people who love you and you don't have to think about how I'm going to pay my bill, you're going to be in a much better position to think about what next steps in your career. Don't get me wrong, everybody experiences difficulties and there are things that are beyond the socio-economical uh, situation, like bereavement and health. But generally, you know, if you're at the bottom of the pile, uh, the problem seems to attract those are problem and they keep you on that sticky floor. Some of the things are seem quite innocuous when you just read it for the first time, but they've had a massive impact. So, you know, and councils were permitted all, all of a sudden in the early part of the, of the last decade to place people into private rented accommodation for the first time. Um, through the Localism Act. Through the Localism Most Act. Most people wouldn't think of that. And that was an, a way that they could just discharge their statutory their legal obligations to house people that was never allowed before that and that has led to um huge levels of housing precarity um amongst people people are unable to afford rent people being evicted um so that kind of base of stable housing stock has sort of um been shifted a bit by legislative changes so this is really sort of specific stuff um we quite geek but all of it adds it's quite up. geeky on the homelessness policy but it does add up and i think you know the the, the fact is we have to have a handle on all of this. We have to know exactly which clause in which piece of legislation has caused this. And the community knows it as well. It's the community who's telling the museum about this stuff. Mm. And thereby, we know what asks that we can, we can then make of policymakers. But I'd like to point out one particular point, and that was one of the demand of our call for action. It was about bringing back services back in house ending the wave of privatization that we've seen rolled out across the sector during the 10 years of austerity. Because those privatization, who do they affect again? It's the lowest paid, it's the people of color, it's the migrant workers, it's the part-time women and disabled workers who are the most affected. Sometimes it's young people as well on precarious contract and zero-hours contract. The problem of privatization is the encroachment of capital in public services. 
Uh, and it hasn't started yesterday. <laughs> it started, you know, 40 years ago uh, with uh, the creation of a new so school of sorts uh, where it was time for public services to be open to the market. And it started often with the energy sector and uh, the transport sector. And then we've seen the NHS and education. And I guess museums were a little bit preserved until the years 2000. Uh, and this has accelerated from the um, arrival of the conservative government back in 2010. Uh, it's an ideology. And basically what he's saying to us is that we will pay from the public purse a private company to make profit, not just deliver a service. Uh, so my question is, if a private company can deliver a service at such a price, including a profit, why can't we? Well, the answer is very simple. It's because the only way they can deliver cheaper and make a profit is because they exploit the people they employ. So often it means less staff, less training, less pay, less um, terms and conditions. What we've seen during COVID is an absolute scandal where people didn't even get sick pay if they fell ill with COVID or if they had to self-isolate. Fortunately, we managed to redress that balance uh, during the first lockdown. Uh, and we did manage to get people uh, paid when they were sick of self-isolating, but we've now returned to the status quo. We also believe that, you know, it's not enough to just call for it and demand it. You actually have to live it. So for example, at the moment, as I mentioned earlier, we're developing our, um, we're, we're going to become an employer, um, hopefully April, beginning of this financial year. And we want to have a flat pay structure, at like national living wage. Um, so we don't believe in like big leadership salaries. We don't believe in a museum perpetuating the inequalities that we're trying to seek to change. And we do believe that you actually have to live it if you're going to call for it. Yeah, I think there's something in this about demonstrating your values through what you actually do. Um, and that's not the same for every institution by any stretch of the imagination. But this is, you, we've started out as an organisation putting on different things on a shoestring with different people from all walks of life, many of whom have suffered um, severe forms of oppression in their lives. And that those values have been formed there, and but then your actions really have to follow from that. And I think we would really be doing, you know, our community a disservice if we weren't trying to put those things into practice. So it is possible, uh, and actually, by paying people a, a better wage, by giving them sick pay and you know a decent treatment of a human being, people will deliver a better work. You know, their efficiency is better, their motivation is better, the turnover is lower. And you can actually sleep at night by saying, well, actually, we're treating people well. So bring back services in house. One of the things the core group came up with in terms of the flat pay, um, they've written a document around it saying, in our organisation, in Museum of Homelessness, we do not only value people in terms of their economic worth, right? We value people in other ways. Um, the things, the, 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 the way that we are together and the way that we look after each other isn't purely based on a, a financial transaction. And I think, you know, I feel like that's a step in the right direction for reforming how we relate to each other in society. Our goal is really to um, help our audiences who visit the museum, whether physically or online, um, to reach conclusions of their own by um, learning about our interpretations of these different events, but to reach conclusions on their own, to think uh, critically and hopefully to take a stand in any way that they may, might choose um, a, a stand against social injustice. We, we have to remain relevant. Um, in the 21st century. And you have to always, whatever the issues at hand are, uh, facing our communities, 
uh, you have to be prepared, you know, to offer information uh, so people can be uh, informed and can make in informed decisions and take informed stands on the issues. And I think we educate probably in the same way, you know, a university does. Um, you come to a university, you're gonna hear, you know, um, different professors from different backgrounds and um, educating people. And you're gonna learn about a lot of different isms and uh, perspectives. And But then when you walk away, you're gonna formulate your own opinions and you develop your own perspective. And that's, and, and all we can hope for, you know, is that people will indeed, you know, um, understand, you know, the crisis uh, that we're in and that they will work to bring about a change. I just feel that when I go to the museum um, with my son, we feel, and, and my son is seven years old and he feels it too, and he can verbalize it, maybe because he's the son of a, of a activist, you know, <laughs> but um, he can verbalize that he doesn't feel like a part of the narrative, like he doesn't feel like a target into the whole displays, like he doesn't feel like an part of the audience, part of the expected audience. This is definitely problematic because to, uh, to feel that as an adult, as a mother, and to feel that as a child um, whose parents are both black, but both Belgian. Um, I think that my situation as a child was different and was more acceptable because I had the feeling that I had the feeling and it was true that my parents were coming from somewhere else. So I could accept uh, more easily to be treated or that they were treated as foreigners because they also felt like foreigners. But for my child, it's different because he doesn't see you. Uh, so ma'am, where, where do you come from? <laughs> so, you know, there's like, um, so yeah, um, I, I know I'm not answering your questions, your question yet, but um, the people into those, the, the institutions have to understand that the norm is not to be white and from privileged um, background. Actually, my audience was me 15 years ago when I was a student because the thing that struck me particularly and has struck me in, in the time that I worked with the Galton Collection was why did I not know this before? You know, why have I had to, it is pure chance. You know, I would be a completely different human um, had I ended up curating a, a different collection, had these ideas not crossed my path and, uh, and to give myself a certain amount of credit had I chosen not to engage with them. Um, like I said, I didn't know any of this stuff before I started working as a museum curator of a collection of scientific racism. Um, the, the, the very fact that my job was that I was responsible for taking care of the stuff of an old dead white man who, if he had had his way, would have had people like me bred out of the system. Um, that is, it's very difficult not to think about that in personal terms. Um, and it's very difficult not to think about that in personal political terms within the context of the university, within the context of museums and in this country. So, yeah, I am trying to indoctrinate people because there are aspects of this story that they have not heard before. And while I had the authority, I don't necessarily have it anymore because I'm not a museum curator anymore. Um, while I had the authority of a museum curator to be able to tell that story, then yes, I wanted to expose people to histories to facts, to, to things that they have not encountered before. Um, not everybody is gonna 
pick up a sign and go and attend a march and and that's not needed some people you know are interested in change through legislation some people are interested in change through education they want to be in the classroom some people are interested in making change through writing publishing um, so there are many many ways to make change and um, we just are there you know as a major repo uh, repository to help facilitate uh, conversations about very difficult issues and again to provide resources uh, and um, and guidance and i think museums do have to bring something as well to a subject which maybe hasn't doesn't always get airtime or, or isn't talked about in a particular way and i remember when we were thinking about the museum and i remember thinking well where do you go to learn about homelessness if you are interested well you can um you immediately your mind goes to christmas fundraising campaigns or uh, an interaction on the street and or um something you might read in the news in the news and and i don't and i always thought well that's not very not very good really <laughs> you know it's not it could be a lot better and i think that's what museums can contribute to any topic that they're tackling the ob contemporary objects that we've been given by a range of people some experience in homelessness some working or volunteering um in homelessness you know they're complete treasures but they're not materially speaking they're like packets of tobacco and bin liners and babies bottles and you know, but they, because of the stories that come with them, and also the the powerful act that is, you know, creating a national collection for homelessness, is, you know, that's, to me, that's very powerful, because we have this problem um, where there's always these schemes and stuff, we were moaning about this the other day, that to help homeless people rejoin society. But it's like homelessness is not outside of society. It is a and has been forever a part of society. By having this national collection and saying, hey, this exists, these stories are valid, these objects are important enough to be in a national collection. Uh, to us, that is a really powerful act. And that's that's why a museum, that's why we've set up a museum rather than another form of institution, because there is a power in museums and this is about reclaiming that power and rechanneling it to a part of society that hasn't traditionally had it. Professionalism is, is the enemy of progress in, in, our, in our profession, because when you look at the history of museums and you look at the history of the complicity of museums in the colonial project, the reason why museums in this country and elsewhere in Europe and in all those other places were set up was a very particular thing. Physically, they were the warehouses of the loot of colonial expansion and colonial violence, the things that were taken were put into museums. They were also spaces for civilizing, you know, the British working class. Those, those people were seen as somehow lesser than, than the people who were setting up the museums themselves or going out and building the empire. So solidarity with the British working classes, as far as that is concerned. And so therefore the whole purpose of the museums, and we see them in the nature of the display, is to decontextualize, is to freeze objects in time, is to tell a very particular narrative and, and also with the cloak of neutrality, rationality, um, as some people have written in national newspapers, it's not the job of museums to rewrite history, except that's what they've been doing all this time. Um, and that's what I mean about why, you know, there's no revolution here. There's nothing revolutionary in the work that I've, I've done. When I was a museum curator, I put on exhibitions. That's not a revolution. That is exactly what the job is. Possibly the thing that I did differently was that I talked about subjects that people haven't talked about previously. I've acknowledged a colonial frame that people have to date been happy to ignore. Um, and I'm interested in people both acknowledging that, fra that frame and also reflecting on what it means for us as museum professionals. If this is who we have been, you know, if we have been tools within the, within the colonial project. Museums are a tool of the colonial project, therefore people that work in them are equally tools of the colonial project. If that is who we have been, is that who we still want to be? It's when you want to hire people um, 
because you want them to represent black people, black communities, Arab communities, Rom communities, and so on and so on. You have to hire people with visions. And when I say that, it's because I'm really fed up of the tokens. What I want to say to institutions is that um, it's time to also, how can I say? People from the dominant group are being told, be original, be yourself, show the difference, make the difference. You know, and people from with the from the minority, they're being told, please don't make the difference, don't make any difference, don't be original, step into um, the line, you know, be aligned and do what we want you to do, say what what we want you to say. There is a contradiction, and I want to put an end to this contradiction. I want the people from the dominant world to stop being scared of visionary people when they are black or Arab and to only allow white people to be visionary people. Um, it's interesting the way that you catch that very explicit threat um, from a politician to say your money is gone unless you essentially tow the party political line. And um, this, becomes, this becomes hugely problematic for people working in museums who as a majority, because I'm talking about my profession here as a whole. I'm not necessarily talking about the people who are very high up in the profession. I'm not talking about, um, you know, fancy directors and those sorts of people, but the vast majority of people that I meet in my profession are not interested in hiding these histories. They are interested in doing this research and bringing these stories to the fore. It then becomes very problematic because first of all, the thing that they're, they're fighting is, you know, am I allowed to talk about this so much we're so bad at talking about ideas to do with race, um, racism, ableism in our society, um, that people feel like they don't have permission to talk about these things. So that then when a senior politician says, you don't have permission to talk about it, that becomes even more problematic. It used to be that museums had to mainly worry about corporate sponsors trying to interfere in the editorial and curatorial process and in the independence of our research institutions. Uh, and now this is something that we need to be concerned about from government. We'd urge colleagues to be brave and not allow government to instrumentalize our institutions in such a way, um, because you know we really need to be concerned with the, the proper telling of history, the proper conserving of history, um, and be accountable to our communities. But above all to be to be independent as possible and to have integrity the main concern there is to do with is to do with the workforce and also to do with the existing what do i mean format organization of museums as 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 things um which is increasing hierarchy well not increasing hierarchy the hierarchies are always there the sort of increasing embeddedness of the hierarchies and um looking uh, also at the diversity of the workforce in terms of in terms of who works in museums. I'm a member of an organization called Museum Detox, which is a professional network for black, Asian, minority, ethnic museum professionals. And um, there's a lot of us, actually, <laughs> that that's something that gives me a cause for hope and for optimism. Um, but I am but I'm mindful of how few of us are in senior positions. Um, there, are, there are more now than there were um, five or six years ago when, when the organization was founded, which is which is spectacular. Um, but I think, yeah, the things that remain a cause of concern are uh, replicating societal and social inequality within the hierarchy of the organisation of the museum. Um, so that, to me, is the cause of concern, because, yeah, if it is the case that the culture secretary says, jump, I'm, I'm concerned about who is responding with how high do you want us to jump? Because I think if, if our workforce looks slightly different, maybe that wouldn't be the response. We hear a lot, oh, no, 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 you know, this is about equality of work and, you know, why all those white men are getting all those top jobs is because they are so good. Absolutely not. Uh, so I think take a chance, uh, employ people with, uh, you know, different looks, different beliefs, different attitudes, 
uh, you may be surprised by the results, but I, I believe on the medium and long term, you actually build something better. Nobody wants war. Nobody, nobody wants polarization of the society. We want to live together. We want to create ways of living together. And I think it's for the benefit of everyone to do that in a peaceful way and to be open and inclusive. I don't want to be someone uh, whose heart would be full of hate. Um, it's tiring to be hateful. It's tiring. It's not, it's not the energy that I want to live with. It's not the, the energy that I want to live in. But then uh, you have to understand that um, when you give reasons for people uh, to people for being angry, at some point they will be angry. And so I think that people into the institutions uh, who maybe come from more conservative backgrounds or ideologies or who, yeah, who have more, ide uh, more conservative ideologies, um, they have to understand that the world is not changing, the world has changed and it's time to embrace this change from now on to avoid um, bad situations. And um, it's not a threat, it's just a fact. I think what I'm concerned about is, you know, just how much is expected of people that work in museums and how much, um, um, how much people have to give of themselves in order to do this kind of decolonizing work, telling these different stories, bringing these different voices to the fore. Um, I think it, historically we've seen that when it comes to talking about race, that's the really, that's the really, really difficult one. Histories of race and empire are the ones that still seem to be very, very triggering for this nation. Um, whereas things like, for example, queer histories is actually, there's been, there's been so much brilliant work done with queer histories in museums recently. Um, so to me, I think, yeah, the, the cause of concern is, is there enough solidarity in the industry to be able to progress past these hierarchies and past these um, inequalities that exist? Um, and I think I'm optimistic that yes, there is, because I know those folks, I'm seeing them. And I've also been talking on a lot of panels about decolonizing museums. So there's clearly, you know, hopefully we can, this will just be more than a single moment as it was a flashpoint last year in 2020. Hopefully it's more than that. Hopefully what we're seeing is really embedded social change in museums. One, one can only be hopeful, but I would say, you know, that we have a huge challenge ahead of us. So many things we're dealing with, of course, the, the public health crisis has changed the face of things, you know, I think forever. Um, the issue of racism is so deeply entrenched. And in recent times, you know, we have seen you know, uh, a resurgence in the very, very blatant uh, expressions of racism and people feeling empowered now um, as a result of the previous, previous administration um, to actually move forward with um, their efforts to, to dominate, to perpetuate white supremacist ideology and practices um, in the same way that we have seen it perpetuated in the past in these United States um, since slavery and after slavery. Um, it's really, it can be frightening when you think about it, but you know, we have fought the battle for so long. It's just for us, it's, it's perseverance and, um, and faith. And uh, so 
yeah, so, you know, you have to be hopeful, but I don't minimize, I don't minimize the challenge that we face.